welcome everyone to the section, the third section today. We're gonna talk about the environmental and uh, climate justice. And our section today, we will somehow put the terms of the resilient future based on the transdisciplinary learning. And yeah, before going to the discussion, I want to pick you up some kinds of the environmental challenges that we can say so. During now today, we um, have to stare with any kinds of the environmental challenges, for example, air pollution, for example, water pollution, solid waste, hazardous waste management, and even climatic change, that probably affect with our, with our life, for example, drought and the flooding in some particular area. And this is the reason that we call for the environmental justice. Yeah, we can simply say that the terms of the um, decision-making processes, the terms of the um, engagement is for everyone in the world. So maybe all groups of the people, regardless of the um, nationality or the um, color, or the income uh, should um, consider as the terms of the environmental event climate justice. So we have to think about the opportunity for everyone to actively engage and also participate in the decision making. This is the problem statement of our section today. And today is really, really great opportunity that we uh, um, invite maybe a professor, maybe a both domestic and international um, site. Maybe uh, we have about five speaker. Each, each speaker, they're gonna give a short um, presentation just about 10 minutes. First is um, Dr. Mojamat Indrawan from University of Indonesia. Uh, second, Professor Dr. Emma Polio. So maybe um, she's for a professor from the uh, Ateneo de Manila University. The third one, um, Kun Pen Chom Satang. She is the director of Earth. And the fourth one, Dr. Diane Archer. She is the senior um, research fellow at SEI in, in Bangkok office. And last one, Mr. Pichet Munpa. Uh, he is now working at the WWF Thailand and also working uh, at, uh, for a PhD at Jualongkorn University. Yes, this is the last slide of my talk. So maybe for today, we'll cover all kinds of this topic. For example, the um, laws of the indigenous people, their gender, and the connection of the um, citizen science the common humanitarian responses to our environmental challenges. And the last one, we can learn more about the social justices, especially the situation of the air pollution. Yeah, that's it for my brief introduction so far. The next, maybe we want to somehow learn or hear from you about the expectation. So what is or what is the expectation for our section? Yeah, maybe um, if you don't mind, you can share us about your ideas, your experiences, or your expectation to our section. So maybe we can somehow um, consider this point during Q&A and also the wrap up for the key question to keynote speaker. So yeah, may, uh, this is core for, um, you can see, um, yeah, some kinds of the uh, expectation that you want to gain from our section. Yes, I think in chat box, maybe we sent you some kinds of the uh, mentry.com. So you can put your opinion there. And after that, we can somehow learn together what kinds of your expect out, uh, outcome, expected outcome that you're gonna get from this section. Yes, that's it. Yeah, some uh, people want to hear about the uh, way to learning more about the action toward environmental justice even in Asia. And some of um, respondents, they want to hear, they want to learn about the innovations. I'm not so sure because the innovation is quite big. Some of them, they mentioned about the social innovation as well. Yeah, this is some kinds of the really, really good uh, terminology. So yeah. What else? If you want to learn from us, please feel free to give you some, give us some idea. 
yeah policy of climate justice yeah yeah this is really good point that we can say something more about the climate justice for today talk can you give me some few points so maybe we can yeah community approach yeah for sure maybe today uh, there are too many professors here he um keen on the topic of the environmental um and community approach it yeah, this is really kind of the uh, smart um, word and also some kinds of the uh, expectations so far for, for our section. For sure, we are um, sure that we can learn together. And yeah, want to learn more about the environmental justice movement in uh, Asia. Yeah, in our region, I think we can somehow discuss more and more in terms of the, uh, this um, uh, principle or the practices. There are too many challenges uh, that we have to uh, solve, we have to face, and we have to fight out for our um, um, Asian region. Yeah, thank you for your comprehensive expectation and comment to our section. The next um, section, we can start up with the first speaker. Uh, I would love to um, uh, kindly ask Dr. Mojamat Indrawan, uh, to share his talk about the um, indigenous peoples in tropical forest margin in Sulawesi province, Indonesia, a case for building social capital in sustainability. Please, uh, Professor Indrawan, that is yours. Thank you, Kun Sutirat and Jalalongkorn University for inviting us and uh, <clears throat> perform this very interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Muhammad Indrawan from Universitas Indonesia and I am basically a biologist, but uh, I've been working with the local communities, so now I am turning myself from a researcher to community supporter. And I would like to share my experience uh, in the building of sustainability while uh, while uh, minding the spirituality. And uh, this is to say, I would like to highlight what IPLC, Indigenous People and Local Communities can do. So uh, the aim is, sorry, can you see my slide now? Yes, we see right? your okay, slide. You. Yeah, just open as a full screen that we can see okay, like the yeah, version. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, this is about uh, more about transformative uh, learning, about uh, how the local communities, when properly supported, they uh, can make changes on the ground. I'm sorry, maybe it is taking a long time. Uh, yeah. Or maybe, okay. Uh, can, can you see now? Um, no? <laughs> I don't think that I see it clearly. Okay. Okay, I think yes, Tommy is no, yeah? work right now. Yeah. So, uh, what the indigenous people and local communities can do, but also a scenario of importance to future literacy. I mean, by the community, for the local people, and uh, for the greater uh, good, and of course for nature. So uh, Sulawesi, maybe you already know, it is in the middle of Indonesia, and I'm in <clears throat> a very small forest uh, island, very remote and very isolated. 1991, uh, that is 30 years ago, we begin our work as a biologist. So there is a lot of species that is found nowhere else in the world. And even uh, we discovered uh, one of the rarest species that is one of top 10 species rediscovered this century. So uh, that is a big finding. Of course, it is not ours. It is because of the local communities. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, because of the protein need, there is a lot of hunting. Ikang, ikang in local language, 
it means fishes, but you can see here, it's not fishes that they uh, hunt. It is birds and mammals. So uh, finally, we consulted with the local communities and they agree that we look at another scenario. We go to, we take them for study tours to North Sulawesi. To North Sulawesi, you can see in the picture, that's a long way, really a long way. Uh, one uh, one uh, day of boat journey. And uh, in North Sulawesi, in Tangkokoi Nature Reserve, we do not teach them, but the local community, hunters and farmers, they teach. So it is farmer to hunter, farmer and hunter to hunter. So not only they learn about the benefit of ecotourism, but they also learn about how to do sustainable agriculture. Again, farmer to farmer. And uh, that is, uh, the first is 2007. And we look at the result 10 years later, 2017. By 2017, uh, we see some transform transformation. There is a revitalization of values. There is conservation. There is restoration. There is local government support, traditional ecological knowledge, nature school, and from traditional ecological knowledge to citizen science, and, and then fighting the local hunting. So very quickly, just a few pictures. This is transformation of local values. Uh, they now uh, put importance to the wisdom of uh, the elders. And also there is uh, the sacred forest called Mumbu and uh, there are the young people guarding uh, because they believe this is uh, this must be protected. And then uh, even they make a biodiversity park, their own land, their own forest, they dedicate for conservation. And also they, they learn. Uh, this is one of my students and the local communities together, teaching and learning. And uh, we do not forget youth. And uh, even the local community, they dedicate their land uh, to protect endangered species. Like this is in the world, only in the island group called the Sula Megapod. Also, they uh, again, without outside funding, uh, this is self-funding, they built their own uh, nursery. And uh, Men and women alike, uh, they do uh, restoration, meaning that they plant the forest trees. There are certain species that is very important and they know uh, what to do about it. And uh, likewise, uh, we uh, involve uh, the, the youth as well and uh, the local newspaper begin to uh, provide attention. And even the local government uh, they, uh, they know uh, because of our campaign, they know and they participate in, they participated in, uh, in the uh, proceedings of the indigenous people. They know the indigenous people are tending nature. And also this is citizen science. Uh, this is one of the community uh, writing to me. <laughs> So it is better than the researcher, very, very neat, very well organized, and they call themselves uh, researcher. They did not even finish elementary school, but who am I to say that they are not researchers? And uh, this is also the smallest monkey in the world. They, they already know, and we got a very good uh, publication because of their uh, expertise. So it is uh, citizen science. A lot of people beginning, not a not lot, but quite a few people beginning to be involved. And uh, there is no school there, right? So uh, we uh, try to revitalize the local knowledge and we said that it is equally important, indigenous and local knowledge as formal, formal knowledge. So uh, hunting village, but they show us they are not hunting anymore. This is couscous carrying. 
and even they design poster poster for anti hunting that they design i just produce but they design and also they learn about ecotourism the youth and i think a discussion only uh, one one last slide that community based conservation emerged a time when science and applied ecology seem to be in the midst of three conceptual shifts. So we are talking about three changes. One is reduction from systems view of the world. Second, to include humans in the ecosystem. So it's not just forest. Forest also, biodiversity also human. And the final, the third is shift from uh, expert base to participatory conservation and management. And in conclusion, in conclusion, mindset uh, need uh, to change, uh, but it takes at least at least ten years. And education is important out of class. Spirituality is basis for sustainability and social uh, capital. You cannot uh, underestimate its important, especially the spirit of volunteer. Imagine this is this is very poor people, and they have spirit of volunteer higher than me. So uh, I think uh, that concludes and thank you again for the opportunity offered to you, Kun uh, Sutirat. Thank, thank you. Thank you for, um, thank you um, Kun Indrawan for your comprehensive um, lecture. And also we can learn from you. You it will put some kind of the real situation and also how smart of the indigenous people that I think I, during the uh, end of the section, we can discuss together once again during the wrap up. Thank you once again for your question. For the uh, participant audience, if you want to ask professor some question, you can um, put in the real question in the chat box. So I think we can somehow learn together. Yeah, thank you for that. And for the second speaker, we would love to invite uh, Professor Emma Polior, and she is now the president of the Asia Pacific Sociological Association. And she is professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Teneo de Manila University from the Philippines. So please welcome uh, Professor Emma for her talk today is about the um, loss of the gender for the climate and disaster resilience, uh, a transdisciplinary approach to building the local lease governance system. Please, Professor Emma. Thank you very much, Consorita. May I share my screen now? Sure. Yes, you can share your screen right now. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen right now as well. Okay. Um, Good morning, and thank you very much, Kun Muhammad, for that very inspiring uh, presentation. And I'd like to thank, you know, Kun Sutirat and Kun uh, Ajarn uh, Surichai and the Chula team for the invitation to speak in Chula's Futures. Uh, this morning, the title of my presentation is Gender, Environmental Rights, and Climate Justice, Transitional Approach to Building Resilience in Local Government Systems. Um, this morning, I'd like to share with you uh, my experience in working with, loc with scientists, local governments, and practitioners in the Philippines in partnership with coastal cities and the others. So you can see there in the uh, bottom line, the um, logos of the local governments we work with, and also um, the Ateneo de Manila University in partnership with uh, Manila Observatory and the National Resilience Council and local governments. So um, the environmental rights and climate justice and gender vulnerability and women's capacities for resilience are all implicated in these challenges for cities. As you can see here, I'm putting here challenges to coastal megacities in the Philippines, people and communities. Here you can see that the challenge of pollution is making the quality of life very low in Metro Manila, also in healthcare and the like. In fact, yesterday in the opening of our Women's Month, I asked the women and I said, do you know that air pollution is a gender and social inequality issue? And they did not know. I even told them there was a study in London wherein they found that 2.5 BPM have reached the fetus of the mother. So they were, they were shocked. And I said to them, 
what we do in the streets, what we do in the cities has very much implication. Uh, here in, um, in Metro Manila, we've made studies where we found that women's children, street vendors, and jeepney drivers are exposed four times to 2.5 ppm. And really, it's, it's an alarming, um, it's an alarming um, metric, and, but it's, the risk cannot be recognized by the people who are highly exposed to them uh, because, you know, uh, pollution and 2.5 um, disappeared as much. So uh, I would also say that gender resilience and sustainable development, uh, they are very much clearly intertwined. I would say that to achieve environmental and climate justice for the underprivileged sectors of society, we must have a green and blue recovery plans and programs and execution of them very well. We have to be focused on SDGs one to six, food security, health, education, water and edu and livelihoods. These are crucial for national local governments and civil society to invest in these sectors and targeted to the people and givers who need them most. Um, I, why would you have to invest in resilience? Because I think, as I said earlier, you know, we need to support the intersectional and transitional approaches to adaptation, mitigation, and transitional resilience. I really think that uh, people um, people cannot really, um, oh, I would say, uh, comprehend resilience unless we really have to look at, you know, who, what, how, when, and why are they exposed to uh, to disaster risk, which are quite complex and dynamic and they're contextually driven. So I think um, we really uh, need to know who, I mean, if, if we have to invest, if we have to reduce their vulnerability, we have to know resilience of what and who are they, uh, when and why women, elderly women, PWs are exposed to vulnerable and climate uh, disaster risks and really, we must invest in reducing the CCADRR exposure and vulnerability to build capacities. Um, also, I think to invest in uh, resilience, we must build partnerships, public partnerships, crucial in advancing the resilience agenda of cities. And we must partner with, like in our case, the coastal cities at risk partnered in Manila with the Department of Science and uh, Technology and the field books, uh, with the Manila Observatory for Climate um, Projections and with Xavier University for Engineering, and of course with the um, Private National Resilience Council. Um, I would say that, you know, in or we cannot afford anymore to be disciplinal or sectoral in our approaches. Our approach in Manila in was in order to understand vulnerability, adaptation, and resilience, we have to do intersectional and transdisciplinary approaches in understanding the contextual drivers of vulnerability, resilience, and to know that this uh, vertical and horizontal uh, factors inter interact both you know, horizontally and, and vertically. Um, so here we basically working with scientists and local governments we basically um, uh, did a climate and disaster risk assessment for Metro Manila and other cities. And you can see here the socioeconomic, the risk profile has terrific implications um, for local risk governance systems. For example, 40 to 60% of Metro Manila's informal sector, informal economy are, uh, belongs to the informal sector. Uh, density wise, it says there are 20,000, but actually in the informal set settlements of Manila, uh, density could be as far as 41,000 per square meter. So also our governance uh, is quite a strange mixture of centralized national government authorities, and but highly fragmented within Metro Manila cities. Metro Manila has 17 cities and municipalities, and they are each city have their own uh, very much controlled um, authority over their people. 
Um, we, this is another city that we partnered. We're in. We work with local government units, the local chief executives, their planners, their DRRM um, managers, uh, gender and development and scientists, and at the University of Philippine, Philippines Visayas to produce a participatory community risk assessment. I really believe that we have to, uh, in my uh, project, we basically subscribe to the transdisciplinarity principles of co-generation of knowledge and stakeholders. And in the process, you co-create the, the capacities of scientists and practitioners, and it should lead to co-ownership and co-benefits of all. So uh, this is, you know, we spent, what, three years doing all of this in the ground just before the pandemic and over the pandemic, we also did some verification. We have application on the EPIGRID. We looked at the distribution of COVID-19 incidents uh, in partnership with the community people. And so we must really basically think in terms of, uh, we have to remember that the climate disaster assessment in the Philippines is a precondition to update the local climate adaptation plan and lead into the updating of the city land use plan and then to the annual investment plan and the policies, programs, and activities of local government. So these are very, when we say we must, you know, be science informed or risk informed in our resilience and um, planning activities and working and to do this you really have to work together, everyone, in order that we are able to produce um, maps that people can really use it as a blueprint of action. Uh, they can use it as a blueprint of action because they were part of participating in it. They know where they are located, who are exposed to sea level rise. Like in this case, you will see the levels. We have ranked the areas in the cities in terms of level of vulnerability to flood, and the level of vulnerability to storm surge and the like. So here also, we basically think that um, we must, you know, to achieve uh, environmental and uh, resilience and climate justice, we must have adaptive, transformative uh, CCADR measures across local, across local governments, uh, commercial, industrial, and vulnerable communities. This one is our mapping of the uh, investments that in Pasig City that households, community, commercial and city um, and the city or government were investing. So um, basically I would like to say, you know, resilience, I always say it's an everyday work and it's a work of everyone. The whole of society approach, we must support together and we must build our common home. Uh, our president was, was lecturing to the youth conference in 2019 and said that each of us, we must care for a space that belongs to everyone, not only to ourselves. And this is my favorite uh, slide now, you know, from year to year, I have favorite slides. And I like this, um, this uh, proverb from Africa. He says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far and farther, we must work together. So here I invite you to our website, the resilience toolkit.ph Philippines. And uh, also I would really say um, uh, the, all of this research is and, uh, and the outputs is really a product of all, of everyone in the community, everyone in the government and everyone in the university and scientific institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, your inspiration. And also, I love, really love your conclusion. You say that please uh, stay together, act together. And this is really some kinds of the um, key um, punctual conclusion that we can do together right now. Yeah, thank you once again, Professor Elmer. So yeah, once again, for, for the audience, if you want to um, ask some question, you can put your question in the chat box, introduce yourself, as, um, just your name and your organization. And after that, we can learn together. And yeah, once again, maybe during the wrap up, we can uh, discuss uh, in special uh, question once again. The third speaker today, uh, welcome uh, Ms. Penchom Setang. And Ms. Penchom, 
uh, she is the uh, executive director of um, NGO that we call Earth in Shot, that stands for the e Ecological Alert and Recovery in Thailand. And her project mainly focused on a range of the environment, environmental monitoring, community empowerment, and also the research action based on the transdisciplinary movement. And for topic of her talk today, she will give us some uh, idea about the citizen science to support solidarity and transformative learning for local communities. Please, um, Kun Pen Shom, maybe you can share us your uh, idea right now. Please welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sitirat and everyone uh, for inviting me to share the experience of uh, Earth uh, to the participants today. Uh, the topic is uh, citizen science to support solidarity and transformative learning for community. Uh, Earth uh, uh, is the, an uh, environmental foundation. We start industrial pollution campaign and advocacy since uh, 1998, and then we set up the foundation in 2009. Yeah, issues of our campaign include environmental and health impact caused by industrial pollution related to toxic chemicals. And uh, the main activities uh, the, that we have done for almost 20 years uh, include environmental monitoring and training, uh, support to community uh, re, uh, environmental protection. We are also involved with uh, law and policy advocacy, uh, scientific and action research. Uh, uh, the, Citizen science is the, is the approach that we have uh, been interested in uh, applied in, into our campaigns uh, for quite a long time uh, because uh, we have worked with uh, several uh, affected communities uh, uh, hit by industrial pollution. And in fighting with the industrial pollution and to protect environment and health of people, we found that uh, citizen science is a very interesting approach to do that. Uh, it is the, the, the approach that uh, finally we found that it is can, can increase the negotiating power of the affected communities in dealing with the polluters and, and government. Hmm. Uh, because we want to avoid, uh, we want to increase the negotiating power because we want to avoid conf confrontation, a crash or uh, of some violence, uh, a protest uh, in many community in, in the past 20 years. And uh, in citizen side, uh, it is the approach that can help the people, uh, my group and communities to produce a reliable quality of data sets. Uh, to produce the reliable quality data sets, uh, we need to collect evidence uh, in, in, in the uh, impacted area. Uh, we need to prove because the working in to, to campaign for uh, pollution, we need to at least to, to prove the unseen hazard of pollutants uh, to the health impact and the impact on environment situation. The data set that we collect and evidence uh, we collect, we need to analyze it. And we have to, uh, to, to analyze in, uh, in the uh, local context or the related context involved with the issue. And then we can produce the strategic information uh, to use in our campaign or in the advocacy or to increase the, the negotiation power of the community. And uh, we, can, we have to involve the public discourse into the process finally. Uh, the, the citizen side and uh, the community em empowerment based on the, the experience that we have done, we see that uh, in, in the situation that when uh, environment has been indicated uh, widely or across the country, we have to increase transparency in industrial pollution management. And this approach uh, is one approach that uh, we use to increase the transparency in the industrial management. Uh, also, uh, it can broaden and improve the participation of people at policy designing level and to promote uh, public access to information. Because uh, what we have collected based on the, 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 the facts at the local context, uh, when we analyze it, 
we produce their strategic information. For these kinds of things, it can help the people uh, and society to broaden the participation at the policy designing level. And uh, more impactful, we need to create a network of environmental monitoring uh, across the region. For example, we have work in the Eastern region, in the Western region and Northeastern regions of Thailand, where the communities have been uh, affected by pollution. And this approach uh, can promote uh, inclusiveness of people. Uh, we have to include interested individuals, uh, professional experts, uh, civil society group uh, in that locality or in, in the central region. And we have to invite an uh, increasing number of community volunteers into the process. This now we have to work together uh, to build up or to support the solid solidarity of the people in each particular area. Uh, we have to, uh, based on the inclusiveness uh, of the working and the approach, and different types of people, they will have a different types of capacity, expertise, and uh, different wisdom that we need to include all of this uh, to promote uh, or to bring some change in, in some area. Uh, this is the, some experience that we have done based on citizen side, like uh, we conduct the VOC monitoring in Rayong province some years ago. Uh, we need to, to find out the answer to local communities about the types of chemicals and the health impact, particularly the types of uh, chemicals in the air that uh, the people have to breathe in every day. And finally, we found this, uh, a lot of uh, ca uh, carcinogen or hazardous chemicals uh, contaminated in the air that the people breathe in every day are uh, released uh, by the petrochemical complex or several types of uh, factories in in, in, in Rayong people. And the fact that we can prove after that, uh, there have been some actions taken by the government. For example, 2005, uh, the Pollution Control Department investigate and collect the air samples ac according or based on what we have found in the area. Uh, 2006, uh, Pollution Control Department also uh, developed a policy framework to monitor uh, VOC contamination in Layong province. Uh, and also in 2006, uh, Industrial Estate Authorities of Thailand, this is the regulatory uh, authority to control uh, or to manage the environmental problem in the, in the factories located in, in the industrial estate. They start to take actions to monitor and to control VOC emission in, in, in that area. 2007 and 2008, the National Environmental Board uh, issue uh, the annual ambient air screening level of volatile organic compound or the VOC for nine VOC together. And uh, finally, uh, Pollution Control Department issues the 24 hour ambient air screening level of volatile organic compound. This is just an example that we have done and based on the success of the uh, citizen side to, to improve the uh, air pollution and to protect the, the people health. Uh, in the Yang province, which is surrounded with a uh, very high uh, hazard uh, 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 industrial factories. Uh, the other example is the PM 2.5 monitoring in Sumusakon province. Uh, we, we, uh, the, the, the project or the activity on this uh, uh, has been stimulated or uh, based on uh, increasing compliance of uh, communities in, in the area because of the emission from uh, recycling uh, or waste management facilities. And uh, in, uh, there are increasing severity of the air pollution and PM2.5 in Thailand, particularly in Bangkok uh, in, the few, in the last few years. Uh, Bangkok people suffer a lot of uh, uh, PM2.5s and we have to uh, estimate and we have to uh, conduct some investigation about the factory located uh, uh, allow the Bangkok area. So this is uh, the part of the activity that we have done under the citizen side monitoring. Uh, now we have to expand the citizen side activities to, to many provinces uh, with the objective to identify, uh, to identify toxic chemicals in environment, uh, to back up uh, communities, the campaign movement, 
uh, most of the activities we have done based in uh, Leong province. This is uh, to fight second uh, the impact of the petroleum, petrochemical, and chemical and waste management, including the waste recycling uh, uh, pollution. Uh, Le province, we have uh, worked with the, the local people to build up the uh, uh, lesson learned and solidarity uh, to the people uh, to campaign uh, to stop the coal mining and the impact of the uh, hazardous chemicals released from the coal mining. In Konkan province in the northeastern, we have campaigned to support the local people who are fighting with the coal power plant and pulp and paper. Uh, in Chonburi, Chacheng Sao, Prajinburi, Sakao, Salaburi, and many other provinces that we have worked with the people as we are asked to, to, to expand environmental monitoring network based on the volunteers or uh, voluntary base of the community who to who runs or to move uh, conduct their environmental movement in that area. Yeah. Uh, there are some 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 problems or some challenges uh, for the litigation, and we found that citizen science also provide uh, evidence based uh, for people who fight against uh, uh, environmental issue or pollution problems. Uh, these are some challenges that we found, and we work with together to to, to uh, overcome the challenges on environmental litigation and to uh, build up environmental justice for, for people and for the Thai society. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you for your um share about the, especially for the community voice, maybe uh, over a part of Thailand that they, they, they want to maybe um, learn by themselves, find the solution by themselves, even keep the track for the information environmental uh, monitoring yeah so appreciate about your sharing experiences and yeah once again if uh, some audience want to ask the question yeah you can ask anytime in the chat box and after that we can somehow uh, recall the question once again during wrap up our discussion thank you again Kakun Pencho. so the next speaker um, Mr. Pichet Moonbao, and I think uh, for the topic of his talk today is about the core humanitarian uh, in the context of climate change. And Mr. Pichet Moonbao, he is now the uh, staff at the WWF with the position of the environmental and social safeguard. And he is now doing the PhD at Jiralongkorn University. So um, please welcome James to give some kinds of the uh, key sharing on the humanitarian responses. Please, James. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ajahn Suturat, and uh, greeting to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, yeah, my name is Pichet Munpa. Um, thanks uh, for the kind introduction. I'm the WWF Thailand staff now responsible for environmental and social uh, safeguard issues, you know, across all the conservation efforts um, you know, in Thailand and also helping the regional teams. Um, on this issue um, in Asia and the Pacific. So um, today I would like to give, I would like to share with all of you, you know, the role of core humanitarian standard on quality and um, you know, accountability and building resilience futures. So um, here is my, I prepare a couple of slides, um, you know, to uh, lead uh, our conversation today. So I divided uh, my presentation into three parts. Uh, the first one, you know, I would like to provide you a very quick snapshot of major disasters, you know, at global scale, regional scale, and a national scale. In this case, it's Thailand. And the second one will be around, you know, resilient building progress here and there. So, you know, um, the first two sections, um, I try to set the tone, set the scene, you know, of uh, my talk why, you know, the uh, core humanitarian standard and, you know, resilience come in. So the last section, which um, I would like to spend the time the most, um, you know, it's about the core humanitarian standard and quality and accountability. And it uh, makes us with, you know, resilience building. So just, um, you know, set the scene. Um, and needless to say about the impacts of climate change. So you can see on the screen, you know, that's uh, the major uh, disasters around the world. But, you know, uh, 
the highest one, you know, the most uh, frequent one is flooding. Uh, there were, you know, 3,002 flood events uh, during 1995 to 2015. And, and uh, when you look at the flooding alone, you know, it's accounted for 47% of all weather related disasters and 43% of uh, nature disasters combined. Uh, narrowing down to Thailand, um, you know, according to the history of Thailand over the last uh, the, uh, 32 years, uh, period from 1995 to 2016, um, you know, we faced uh, 69 major floodings you know, in the country. And of course, um, you know, 15 out of them um, uh, lasted for a month and you know, uh, had a lot of uh, severe consequences in terms of social, socio and socio and economic. So just uh, share with you the, uh, some photos of flooding in Thailand. And now it's about, you know, we're talking about disasters, right? Now, you know, the resilience building performance, um, so I took this uh, information from uh, the reports uh, developed by um, UN agencies. Um, they refer to you know, 10 essential making city resilience um, framework uh, developed by UNDRR. So this is the overall performance of the local governance in disaster resilience and risk reduction. You can see you know, the 10 essential things there like governance, uh, risk identification, financial capacity, urban development, natural ecosystem, uh, institutional capacity, uh, uh, societal capacity, infrastructure resilience, uh, prepar preparation and response. And the last one is build back better. So uh, th this is the overall um, picture. Um, and this one is the climate resilience in the region. Uh, the previous one is um, the, global, the global picture. Narrowing down to Southeast Asia, so I'm gonna go quickly. So, um, you know, when I think this uh, study conducted a few years ago, uh, you can see the score um, around, you know, the uh, multi-hazard and exposure, um, the uh, vulnerabilities uh, in Asia and Pacific, um, lack of uh, curb capacities and also a risk score and where we are now, you know, for um, ASEAN country members, you can look at the score and uh, you can, unfortunately, Thailand is, you know, the, um, we did um, not quite good you know, in terms of a resilience building, according to this study. And um, the, the recent study um, was conducted in 2018, tried to measure, you know, the overall resilience in Thailand. And, you know, um, the, fighting, the fighting of this uh, study point, pointing that, you know, Thailand, we, um, we, we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, room for improvements. So in the, in the future, you can see the score is 2.92 out of five. So it's a long way to go. And I took, um, maybe some of you uh, seen this before, you know, it's um, published in the recent, in the recent, you know, uh, uh, six assessment report for, of the IPCC uh, on impacts and uh, adaptation and vulnerability. So you can see the, uh, your left-hand side, um, you know, so, so this, uh, this, uh, this picture show you, you know, uh, that is a rapidly um, narrowing window of opportunity to, um, you know, enable uh, climate resilient development. You can see at the left hand side is, you know, societal um, choices about adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development um, made in um, you know, arenas of engagement. So it means, you know, if we engage more people. Um, it means, you know, we have more hope, you know, to um, keep the temperature down um, below two Celsius or 1.5 Celsius. So they mentioned that, you know, enable actions um, toward um, higher climate resilience development. 
So the, the engagement that I just um, mentioned earlier, you know, is about engagement with community, social, political, um, ecological, uh, knowledge, technology, and um, economic plus financial. So and the, at the uh, red uh, circle, um, you can see that's the opposite, um, you know, of the uh, dimensions uh, that I, I mentioned earlier. So you can see where we are now. We are in here, right? The 2022. You can look at the. Um, I cannot. I don't know how to point it on the screen. But so uh, in summary, you know, we miss a lot of opportunities, right? To uh, um, bring the temperature well below 1.5. Um, but when we, but there's still a hope, right? To you know, do everything that we can do. Um, you can see, you know, we have benchmark in 2030, where we aim to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so yeah, we still have hope. Uh, if, we, if we do uh, what we committed, um, you know, uh, to do in terms of climate change and climate justice. So resilience. Um, Needless, needless to say more um, about the definition of resilience, but you know, this slide I try to um, point out that you know, resilience is um, is like is like a, a common foundation. Um, you know, the uh, common areas for um, those um, uh, existing uh, sustainable development frameworks. Uh, for example, you know, SDGs. Um, Paris agreements, which is uh, climate negotiation and disaster risk reduction. So these uh, three frameworks, um, you know, when you look at um, the intervention, the indicators, so they are also talking about the same thing, which is uh, increasing capacity of communities, reducing uh, vulnerability, and also, you know, uh, reducing exposure. And on the right hand side, the uh, green flowers um, that the, uh, you know, uh, call humanitarian standards uh, that I, 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 I would like to zoom in a bit. And so the call humanitarian standard on quality um, and accountability or CHS in short, you know, it sets out nine commitments that organizations and individual um, you know, involved in humanitarian response can use it, you know, to improve the quality and effectiveness of assistance um, they provide. Uh, the, the, this standard, you know, places or puts uh, communities at, um, uh, you know, the center of the intervention. Um, and, you know, as a core standard, uh, the CHS describes the essential uh, elements of uh, principle, um, you know, around accountable, accountability and also high quality humanitarian aid. Um, so this standard is uh, voluntary and measurable. Um, the CHS is a result of a global uh, consultation process. Yeah, it uh, uh, draws together key elements of uh, existing humanitarian standards and commitments. So you look at the nine commitments. The first one is around you know, the humanitarian uh, response uh, should ensure that communities and people affected by crisis um, receive assistance appropriate and relevant to their needs. That's number one. Number two is, you know, community and people uh, affected by crisis have access to the humanitarian assistance they need at the right time. So not too late, you know, when you go to the community and provide the humanitarian assistance. Number three, communities and people affected by crisis um, are not negatively you know, affected and are more prepared, resilient and less at risk at the result of humanitarian actions. So, you know, it's about do no harm, you know, um, in the humanitarian response. So communities, number four is community and people affected by crisis know their rights and entitlement. So they have access to information and uh, participate in decision-making uh, process that affect them um, at the community level or you know, at a um, uh, high level. So 
Number five is commu communities and people affected by crisis have access to safe and responsive mechanisms to handle complaints. Grievance mechanism um, is in place at community level and is relevant to their culture and their context and to facilitate them to, you know, um, and, and empower them to, to uh, be able to raise their concerns. Uh, number six is about communities and, and people affected by crisis receive uh, coordinated complementary assistance. So, you know, when the crisis occur, many organizations jump in. So we have to ensure that we coordinate it and complementary to each other, you know, to provide aid. Um, seven communities and people affected by crisis can, you know, expect delivery of improved assistance as organizations learn uh, from experience and uh, reflections. Uh, number eight, community and people affected by crisis receive the assistance they require um, for, you know, a competent and well-managed uh, self and uh, uh, well-managed staff and volunteers, right? Last but not least, uh, community and people affected by crisis uh, can um, expect that organizations uh, assisting uh, them are uh, managing resources effectively, efficiently, and ethically. Um, that's, um, you know, the quick uh, introduction of uh, the core humanitarian standards and it's a nexus to, you know, resilient building. So I'm stop here and uh, uh, let's hear more questions and comment at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, James, for giving us some kinds of hope. You say that we still have hope to think about the environment, even in terms of the justice or something like that. So yeah, maybe we can learn more about the core of the humanitarian during the wrap about this discussion. And right now I saw some kinds of the uh, chat box, maybe one question to um, Kun Indrawan and another question to um, Dr. Emma. So you can check on about the, your question and we can once again discuss in the same uh, topic together. Okay, the last presenter today, welcome Dr. Diane. Uh, Dr. Diane, she is the um, senior research fellow at SEI. And once we talk about the expert of Dr. Diane, she uh, focused on uh, her study in the terms of the urban poverty, urban community-led development, and also go uh, urban governance in the cities of Asia and in Africa. And she used to work at this, almost the same thing with James about the humanitarian crisis in the urban area even as adaptation to climate change in the cities. But for her talk today is uh, maybe focused about the um, impacts of the urban air pollution, uh, clean air for all. This is some kinds of the key question that she want to start up the talk with a simple question. So welcome Diane, uh, maybe you can enjoy your talk. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Paj and Zutirat, and thank you to all my fellow panelists for your talks. I hope that mine will build nicely on some of the issues that have all be already been raised uh, in the previous um, uh, presentations. Uh, just a note about SEI Asia. We are a research to policy institute, uh, so we do research on the ground uh, with the aim to uh, have an influence on decision makers. Um, for a more sustainable and inclusive and resilient uh, future. And I am an urban, research, urban researcher uh, leading the urban research cluster at SEI Asia based here in Bangkok. So today I'm talking about the topic of uh, differentiated impacts of urban air pollution. I think uh, those of us living in, air, in Asia are quite familiar with the problem of um, air pollution, uh, particularly PM 2.5 pollution um, that might be either on a seasonal basis if we're living in Thailand uh, or all year round if we're living in um, other places such as in uh, Dhaka or Delhi um, in India. So I think one of the key um, points I want to make today is that the even though air pollution uh, sort of is present in the air that everyone breathes, uh, we don't all share the burden equally based on um, what type of work we do, where we live, uh, whether we're male or female, 
um, whether we have any pre-existing conditions, um, our age, um, and uh, many other factors. So this, for example, the first chart shows the years of life loss uh, due to ambient particulate matter, so pollution in the air around us um, in general. And we can see already that there's a big discrepancy between male and female years of life loss, um, particularly in China and Mongolia, it's very obvious, but even places like Thailand and Vietnam, the rate is double um, between male and female. So men are much more likely to live less long because of uh, pollution exposure. Then if we look at the topic of air pollution in the household, uh, particularly in places where solid fuel is still used for cooking, there is still this uh, burden that is heavier on men. And this might be due to, to some pre-existing um, habits such as, for example, smoking, which is more prevalent among men. Um, this is despite the fact that women are more likely to be the ones spending more time inside the home cooking and doing the activities that generate um, household air pollution. But because men uh, in general face more exposure um, at home, but then also um, outside and at work, this has a larger implication on them. And we can see this here in terms of occupational exposure to particulate matter, but also gases and fumes. Again, men are the ones who, who are uh, most affected. Um, and this might also be due to the types of jobs that men are more likely to do, for example, in uh, heavy industrial manufacturing or uh, working in um, the transportation sector, such as as bus drivers or security guards or traffic police. Um, these are often predominantly uh, male jobs, and so their exposure to air pollution is, uh, is higher as a consequence uh, of their job. So we can see that um, this is uh, one way in which uh, the general population is affected by air pollution. But then we also have to consider if we do take action uh, to fight air pollution, how is that burden borne? Um, obviously, we want to fight air pollution, but there can be uh, unintended impacts of the actions that are taken, uh, which might affect uh, certain population groups differently and in ways that are not necessarily beneficial. And I'm not just talking in terms of physical impacts, but we also have to consider the broader socioeconomic impacts as well. So, for example, if uh, polluting factories have to uh, implement um, uh, uh, scrubbers or other technologies to clean uh, emissions, uh, how is that cost absorbed? Uh, do employers end up uh, not increasing workers' wages uh, in order to absorb this cost? These are the questions we need to understand. Um, do these measures uh, either produce or reproduce inequality and exclusion? So for example, very often we see street vendors uh, who grill chicken or have other grilled foods being targeted as a source of air pollution. But on the scale of things, it's probably not as big an issue as uh, major traffic jams uh, in a city like Bangkok, for example. Um, but at the same time, um, it might be that street vendors are targeted um, as a less powerful actor who can be more easily pushed off uh, the streets, um, but that impacts their livelihoods. So can we find solutions that benefit everyone? For example, developing clean technologies for grilling chickens so that uh, street food vendors can continue to work. And then are there specific gendered impacts? So if you close schools uh, to because of peaks in air pollution, does that mean that carers have to stay home uh, to look after the children? And very often these carers are women workers um, who then have to lose um, a day's worth of income, for example. So we factor in all these uh, possible consequences of actions um, when, when we are trying to fight air pollution. The other big topic is, for example, around agricultural burning, which is a big source of air pollution in Thailand. Um, and uh, the farmers often get blamed for burning uh, 
the uh, sugar cane before harvesting or burning rice stalks at the end of the harvest. But we have to ask, why are they burning? Is it because they can't afford the alternatives? They cannot afford uh, to get um, the harvesting machines, which cost uh, many millions of baht and farmers are already heavily in debt. So should it be the responsibility of the farmers or should it be the responsibility of the sugar producers who buy the sugar cane off the farmers? These are big um, uh, companies uh, that uh, are buying sugar cane off uh, uh, sugar cane growers across the country. So they have the capacity to take action uh, if they wanted to, to ensure that burning is not the method used uh, for harvesting crops. So uh, how can we direct um, action uh, at the appropriate actor as well? Uh, so these are some questions we are also working on at the moment at SEI in a project funded by IDRC to understand better the implications of air pollution uh, in a labor and work context and specifically gender implications. Um, in another project that we're carrying out with Chula Longkorn University and with Ajahn Sutirat specifically, we have been doing um, air pollution sensing in the local environment around the university and focusing particularly on people who work outside, um, asking them to track um, their movement around the city and carrying a PM 2.5 sensor as they do so. Unfortunately, we are still um, analyzing this data, so I can't share it with you today, but I can share you the results from the questionnaire that we did alongside this. Um, so 86% of respondents, uh, there were 180 respondents, agreed that uh, air pollution is harmful to health, and most of them do try and monitor what the situation is with regards to air quality on a day-to-day -day basis. 10% um, of them are always concerned about the impacts of air quality, and 80% uh, of them are sometimes concerned. Um, and this is probably because air pollution is quite seasonal uh, in Thailand. Um, in terms of whether we can solve air pollution, it's interesting to see that the same num same proportion almost uh, seem to think that you can't solve it as I uh, think you can solve it. Um, so maybe there's a certain feeling of, you know, we have to live with this um, and uh, there's nothing we can do. But actually, we there is work for us to do as researchers and as civil society to raise awareness about Actually, there is a lot of action that can be taken uh, to address air pollution, and it should be taken as well. Uh, the majority of respondents feel that uh, government uh, is, should take responsibility for solving air pollution, but also many do feel that citizens have a part to play in this as well. And then in terms of the source of air pollution, um, bearing in mind that these are people who uh, live and work in central Bangkok, uh, Many of them felt that traffic was the source and construction work as well. Uh, but interestingly, uh, there was also a high number who thought street food vendors were responsible. And um, many of the respondents to this survey would have been outdoor uh, uh, informal workers, such as street food vendors or uh, motorbike drivers uh, and so on. So maybe this is an area where we need to address um, you know, find uh, equitable solutions to reduce um, the smoke generated um, by outdoor cooking, but without impacting on livelihoods and the important um, cultural and social social um, uh, services that street street vendors provide uh, in Bangkok as well. So, in terms of further areas of action. Um, there is a push in Thailand to have a Clean Air Act to highlight that uh, the right to clean air is a human right that everyone deserves. Um, and there should be a polluter pays uh, principle being uh, enforced, but also better communication and dissemination of air quality information so that uh, people are able to easily access information about air pollution, but also its impacts on their health. And also um, what action can be taken uh, so that there isn't this attitude of, you know, there's nothing that we can do about it, we have to live with it, even if it affects our health. Um, and at the same time, we also should highlight that acting on air pollution is actually really beneficial for climate change in many 
uh, in many aspects. So for example, by acting to reduce uh, emissions from traffic or industry or agriculture, that will help reduce greenhouse gases um, and therefore help to mitigate climate change. But at the same time, there are also measures that we can take that uh, not only help to reduce air pollution and help fight climate change, but also help to contribute to development priorities and meeting the SDGs as well. So we should be working um, with um, government actors um, and with civil society to ensure, uh, and obviously with the private sector, to ensure um, that these measures are taken. Uh, to, to achieve these goals. And just to close, um, I think um, this was a photo that I like to share. It's a condominium uh, being constructed uh, in Bangkok. And uh, the new luxury is air free of PM 2.5, but really we should be arguing that this should not be a luxury at all. It should be a basic human right. And it doesn't matter whether you live in an informal settlement or a, a luxury condominium, everyone has the same right uh, to clean air. So let's act uh, towards that uh, now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Diane, for uh, uh, giving uh, sharing us about the photo of the condominium, even they put the term the PM 2.5 there. Yeah, this is really some kinds of the good way of thinking that, yeah, some kinds of voice or community uh, stakeholders uh, attitude and also perception on this particular view. Yeah, thank you for that. I think uh, for the next is time for discussion and wrap up for the section that we can jump in together. We can join in together about the key discussion that you want to um, uh, somehow ask the question. So uh, are there any question uh, so far to the speakers or the keynote speaker? If not, um, yeah, are there any question? I think in the chat box that we see the question from uh, Annie. I'm sorry if I'm, uh, I uh, give you wrong pronunciation. She asked about the education for the local community from uh, Kun Indrawan. Uh, if you don't mind, can you somehow respond a bit on the key question about the education for the community, local community? Can you say something on uh, that question? Um, hello again. <clears throat> I'm sorry I did not <clears throat> hear very well. But if I'm correct, it is about local education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see chat box. Yeah, maybe I think your colleague, Annie, I'm sorry. She wants okay. to learn from you that uh, you are, did your organization or did your program teach the young uh, people in the area to do the research or writing some kinds of the, I'm um, considering your presentation. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, mainly we learn from the local community. That is what I call as indigenous and local knowledge because <clears throat> they know how the forests work. <clears throat> they know about uh, nature. So, uh, that is called also traditional ecological knowledge. On the other hand, they did not go to element, even many did not go to elementary school. And, and then they feel that they are left behind. But <clears throat> my team tried to encourage that nobody is perfect. Uh, okay, they can learn from us, but uh, there is a lot we can learn from them. And then we help them to document. So that is the documentation of indigenous people's knowledge or what we call as traditional eco ecological uh, uh, knowledge. <clears throat> Actually, uh, I have many papers because of that knowledge, but I have to find a way to recognize their knowledge, whether in the paper or whether in the uh, activity whereby we also teach them as much as they can for instance, we have volunteers from France and Australia, and we ask them to teach the indigenous people uh, English language. 
uh, even though maybe they do not uh, really read or write, but uh, we have uh, learned they are able. They are able to learn uh, English. And that is very good because with the isolated community, you have to do the safeguarding that they are not polluted. At the same time, you have to facilitate they learn from the outside world. They teach and they learn. So that is about interaction. That is about learning. I hope that answered the question. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think okay, so. Thinking. Maybe, uh, maybe any. I think you can respond about the uh, qualification from Kun Indra one. I do agree to you that TEK is very important in your country, especially for the concept of TEK that you yeah, mentioned, TEK. traditional <laughs> ecological um, knowledge. This yeah. is very really important to um, dive the uh, knowledge uh, for the indigenous people. Okay, thank you for your qualification. For thank the second, in the chat box, yeah, maybe <clears throat> Natasha, you want to say something for the qualification? You share uh, about the climate change in your city, in your country, and you want to, do you want to share something by yourself about your way of thinking to the speaker? Maybe she's having this technical issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, Natasha, are you, yes, you want to say oh, something yeah. about your um, <laughs> concern about your question or the discussion today as speaker? Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure if I can call it a question more so than a comment. Um, just uh, with the topic at hand on climate justice, I find it's, it's very prevalent um, to islands such as mine, a small island developing state uh, like Barbados and other islands in the Caribbean that um, we are currently trying to engage in climate mitigating actions, but there's only so far that those actions go because the problem exists outside of us. Um, so even when projects are undertaken to, to um, try to help with this mitigation process, you would find that um, with, well, with what I mentioned in my comment um, with one particular project where they were putting dunes and other such uh, uh, along the coast uh, to protect the coast because we realized that the East Coast is slowly disappearing. Um, those were damaged and um, with the seas becoming rougher, the waters getting warmer and, and, and storms are becoming um, more virulent um, all due to climate change. Um, it's, it's, it's a fr frustrating um, thing to see uh, because as much as we do is only so far as it, as it goes. Um, so with constantly seeing um, talks like the COP26 um, and, and even with the latest IPCC report, um, the, the, it's not looking very good for countries such as my own, basically. Consultorat, may I follow that up? Sure, sure. Yes, go ahead for that. Y yes, I'd like to uh, connect to Natasha's points. And uh, that's why in my presentation, I talked about the intersection of structural and non-structural adaptations because um, last week I went to uh, and talked to the disaster risk management officer of Real Quezon, that's on the eastern seaboard of the Philippines. And as I told him, the sea level, uh, seas are rising faster in the eastern seaboard of the Philippines than in the eastern side. And then he, he told me, oh, I have to protect my people. I have to build the seawall. And I said to him, why don't you build the coastal mangroves? Because by 2030, your seawall will be already, you know, uh, over flooded. But because of the local government, infrastructure, structural infrastructures are the one that are mobilized or at least, you know, people can see it. And so local government authorities would rather build seawalls when actually, you know, we should build the ecosystem, we should build the capacity of the people around to basically um, support their livelihoods and ecosystems, which are very much supported by those mangroves and other things. But I, I think what I'm basically saying, Natasha, is that uh, we, are up, we are, you know, an uphill battle 
uh, people in general and the local and national government thinks of technologies, infrastructure as a solution, not the soft uh, infrastructure solutions, building the capacity of people, appreciating what the ecosystems uh, can do to their livelihoods and, and things like that, you know, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your um, interesting discussion about this point. Probably uh, maybe next time, if Natasha want to um, learn more, I think we can contact uh, Professor Emma directly. And yeah, we, I, we have about eight minutes left for our section. So maybe the next question from the audience, they want to learn from Di Dr. Diane. Uh, she asked that, um, do your research project include quantification of economic, social, and environmental costs of air pollution? Uh, we are hoping, um, we are carrying out case studies right now in uh, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand with, with regards to the implications of air pollution in the world of work. Um, so this, uh, this research is being done right now and we hope that uh, within the next few months we should have the data available um, to try and quantify what some of the impacts are. Okay, yes, I think next time, if we have a chance, we might ask you again to give some kind of the result of that analysis. It's good for everyone here. So maybe we have five minutes left for sec this section. Are there any quick questions to the speaker so far? Who you want to ask the question to the speaker? Okay, if no, may I take this opportunity? because maybe I have no time to wrap up anything, but I want to learn from this speaker. Um, in your viewpoint, um, you, some of you mentioned about the community participation. Some of you mentioned about the voice of the community. So in short, I want to learn from you that how could the concept of the citizen sign, the concept of the community participation can somehow reduce the um, social inequality and also to um, strengthen the um, uh, weight of also the solution of the environmental justice. Yeah, how this kind of concept is good for reducing this kind of the situation or the problem. That's it, my Con really, really uh, common question. So Richard, so may, may I take it first? Sure. Uh, uh, in my presentation, I talked about, you know, uh, producing actionable science through transdisciplinary action research principles. And I enumerated one basically is that if the knowledge has to be meaningful to, to mm -hmm. all the stakeholders, we have to co-generate, co-produce knowledge with them. And in the process of doing so, working together, we develop capacities, scientists, practitioners, capacities to work together. And how do we translate this knowledge into micro, macro, micro macro policies at the local level and work with the other actors so that we can you know co-own and co-benefit from the whole enterprise so i'm speaking as a professor who's been working for the last you know, so many years working with people on the ground but as you know you know universities are very disciplinarily grounded local governments are sectorally driven so we really have to work together insist that meaningful knowledge and action can only take place within this process. So I'll give you an example, like when we produce the part, we, I feel that as climate, you know, to produce climate disaster risk assessment now, which is um, a precondition in our local governments in order to do a climate, uh, to do a local climate adaptation plan. And I really start with saying we have to, involve the people on the ground participate and identify who are at risk, uh, what are they at risk to, uh, what are their vulnerabilities and their capacity. So I, I think uh, to involve people on the ground, their voices and their perspectives, it's very mm -hmm. important that we have to work with them. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, always a lot of people say for them. No, we have to work with for all of mm -hmm. us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is good for the conclusion for the environmental justice. Yeah, we are not just not just someone, but we have to do something together. This is some kind of they are punctual conclusion from uh, Professor Emma. 
are there any support idea to um, uh, give to like the way to wrap up or conclude about the significance of the um, CD or community participation or the citizen sign? Uh, do you want to add on some information on that? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, Dr. Emma. Uh, I, may, I may add a little bit, uh, some, some points, a few points, like uh, the, based on the experience, I have seen that the integra uh, integration between uh, local knowledge and uh, local wisdom and the technical information are very important uh, to build up the, uh, or to uh, empower the communities. Uh, as well as to translate information into action, which is very important. If no action, nothing will, will be changed, uh, particularly at the policy level. Or uh, if you want to improve the environment quality or to build up justice to, to the environment or to the community, action is very, very important. But the action needs to be based on uh, knowledge and information and rely particularly reliable information. Uh, support from outsider is also important. Uh, support from uh, uh, social media, uh, uh, online media, uh, academic expert, and civil society. So, so different types of support are very important. Uh, these are some basic uh, factor that I, I think it is uh, very important to be changed and to to build up the, uh, uh, this uh, social learning. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, wonderful um, contribution about these kinds of the question. So um, are there any quick um, additional comments, maybe from James, Kun Diane, or uh, maybe uh, Kun Indrawan to last question? Can I answer on the power of community voices? Sure, yes. Yeah. So it relates to both enhancing local environmental climate justice and minimizing social inequality. That is the question as I understand it. And <clears throat> my immediate thinking is after 15 years uh, documenting uh, the great capabilities of indigenous people and local communities and also uh, learning about their altruistic potential, that is forest conservation, forest restoration, infallible knowledge about nature. Uh, they are really uh, potentially a great contributor. But uh, I have a question. If you are talking about justice, when they have safeguarded the rainforest, they have <clears throat> protect the climate. How do we re reward them? Uh, if the government is uh, not yet doing affirmative action, how do general public help build their capacities? So I answered the question, but now I close with the question, how do we reward the the heroes of the planet, <laughs> mm. so to speak. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the yeah, opportunity. This is, this is really good conclusion because you conclude with a question and the key question mm. is not uh, easy to answer right now. So may I take this opportunity to wrap up our section today, uh, section three. So based on our um, active intellection or discussion and even the question of Akun Indrawan, we can say that the Mantai stakeholders both um, local authorities, local government, and also the population. I think they can they have to work together, think together, and act together. I as always put the term together as other uh, professor Emma mentioned. And I think uh the multi-sectional of SDGs is really important to bring anyone uh, anyone together, <laughs> any discipline together to dive and to solve these kinds of the environmental and climate justice related problem. And that, that's it. The keyword should be we all here have to think together and to, uh, act together and move our society together in order to minimize all kinds of the injustice. So maybe this is some kinds of the key um, uh, conclusion that wrap up so far. 
Um, on behalf of the organizer, I would like to once again thank you for everyone to be here. 